That's right. Hey, hey, hey. This your head. Oh, God. Oh, oh. oh God. Now we carry you. This your head. Now we carry you. Oh, boy. Oh, my God. Now we carry you. We are about to start something dangerous tonight. That's awesome. Right. We're about to start something. Dangerous tonight. How are you, bro? I'm ready, Baba. Yes. I'm ready. Yes, so tonight we're talking about power shift part two. Great. Power, Great. power shift. Great. Part two. And I welcome you to Mind Transformation with the Catalyst. My guest tonight needs no introduction. He's my brother from another mother. We're simply talking about power dynamic. We all know that power bows to power in this world and superior power always subject any other power friend my brother the rukos is with us luckily during your only called pk pk look they're listening to you from everywhere in the world uh, awesome you know and, and so please go for it you know you just take it from where you ended last week great pop central great. Is also transmitting this live and so great People watching you on, on, on DSTV tonight. So go for it. Great. Awesome. Let's go. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you, my brother, my friend. Thank you for all you do. Thank you for your gift of access. Thank you for sharing your platform. Thank you for the intelligent, robust articulation of value in this season. The comfort that you bring to millions across the world um, is awesome. It's amazing. Um, a lot of people are drawing so much inspiration and comfort from this. Um, we celebrate it. Um, I just want to encourage you, sir, keep moving. You are doing an awesome thing. You know, these things don't, don't send in money, but it's sending so much meaning and legacy. Thank you so much. You are an apostle of that. You represent that. You embody that. And it is just your personal concern to see people multiply. I celebrate that. And thank you for giving me the, the blessing to be on top of this as well. I do not take it from granted one minute. Okay. Um, um, last week was was great. The feedback has been remarkable, right? Um, a lot of DMs have been coming in and people, you know, asking more questions. See, there are some basic things that are critical that we all need to get in architecting power in this period. Power architecture is it's not a substitute. It's, not a, it's no longer a prayer point. You know, it's not what you are waiting for some um, spiritual maneuver to bring to you. This is an open door, right? Pretty much like God has empowered, you know, people everywhere by creating and permitting a level playing field of revelation as the new impact for for driving this oh my god my battery is quite low man man of god i don't know how i miss that can you help me hold on um let me quickly get the battery connected i'm so sorry i don't know how i miss that it's just right. one minute i'll be right back please awesome awesome awesome, awesome. so we're talking about power dynamics you want to be able to ask yourself you know am i connected to am i connected to power and if you are truly connected to power, what is the source of your power? And what power do you therefore have? And what powers we battle to your And in this dispensation that we're in, the COVID-19 season, <laughs> you know, some people think that uh, they're in COVID-19, while some other people are already in post-COVID-19. And so there are critical things that you need to do, there are critical power audits that you need to take. Uh, one of the power audits is the audit of identity. Uh, power is useless without your identity. Power is useless without power brand. Power is useless without a power brand DNA. I ask you now, what is your power brand? What is your power brand DNA? What are the elements and the components of your brand DNA? Hmm. You know, that is where it starts from. It starts from DNA. What substance do you you know, uh, you perform. What form do you, you know, uh, encapsulate everything in terms of substance and in terms 
or function how do you put form to it and how do you present that so that's deep with it power starts from connection from the higher source or the source of power and so what is your supreme source of power? what power is it giving you to dissipate because every human being has a level of gifting of power and if you do not utilize your power you will dissipate it and someone else but, will take your power and engage it you can take it from there i was just telling them that power comes from within yeah thank yeah. you so much thank you so much my brother i'm so sorry for that great transmission please i apologize to everybody it's just for you know I say every time that we pride ourselves in our capacity for excellence, but we sometimes fail. So this is one of those excellent gaps. So please, you know, bear with us. Okay, let me catch my breath. I had to run downstairs, run back up, you know, to, to solve all of that. Okay, so um, um, yes. So I was talking about power dynamics. And the idea that God is not just um, waiting for people who are going to uh, just sit down to receive from him. God is waiting for ideal shepherds who can accept responsibility at a level. I'm going to be focusing more on that level today so that people can understand the transition. Um, of power and the architecture of power. So, so, so my conversation today is pretty much about how power moves, pretty much of how it changes its custodian. Because power is not residual. Power, every form of power has a expiry date, right? And how do you um, ensure that power continues with you in some type of format that pretty much define your relevance. And most importantly, how do you architect that? Okay? So at the time, we have the Ottoman Empire, massive kingdom. Where is Ottoman Empire today? Turkey, Turkey. People forget that Greece actually ruled the world as the Greek Empire. We spoke, we spoke Greek like we spoke English, like we speak English in the world today. Greek was... Everywhere, Alexander the Great, that was the legacy of Alexander the Great. Where is Greek now? It's seeking stimulus from the IMF and seeking comfort from the European Union month in, month out. In Greece, um, Italy was the Roman Empire, pretty much. That was the Roman Empire. Where is the Roman Empire now? It's in humble Italy. Humble Italy. Then, the British Empire that colonized the world, that even colonized the United States of America, that even colonized the United States of America. Where is the British Empire? The United Kingdom. Humble in the United Kingdom. They are still not dead, but they are not the superpower they used to be. What does that tell you? When we left the Stone Age, stone was not exhausted in the world. When we left the Stone Age, Stone was not exhausted. Stone did not finish in the world. We just found better ways of doing things. <laughs> we just found the stone is still useful. The stone is still useful. You can still use a stone to kill. You can use a stone to break stuff. We use stones to build stuff. So stones did not um, lose their usefulness, but they faded in relevance. So when we are talking about power movement, it doesn't mean that because we're powerful today, you are going to be, um, uh, we are not going to be powerful tomorrow. No. What power irrelevance means is basically that you have shrunk in the authority you used to wield, in the power you used to wield. So you are not going to vanish. You will still be there. I can go for churches at the time like, you know, um, the, the Catholic Church was everywhere. Everyone has to be Catholic or you are not a Christian. But the Catholic Church is still there, but the penetration is different. The Anglican Church, the Protestants were all over the place. Methodist Church. People always forget that the same Methodist Church is the 
legacy of John Wesley, of the great John Wesley, you know. But the Methodist Church today is not dead, but it's not where it used to be. So nobody's saying your name will be forgotten. Nobody's saying you are going to disappear. Nobody's saying we're not going to see you again. You will be around, but you will not be present. Do you see? <laughs> you will be around, you know. You are not just present enough to govern global thinking or to govern behavior. Now, the moment your power has faded, what it means is that you are still eating, you are still going out, you are still coming back. People still recognize you as a force in the domain you need to dominate, but you are no longer the premier dominant force that is shaping culture in that space. You are not the one that is it's not about market leadership. It's about being the culture shaper, being the behavior governor or the thinking governor. You are governing thinking. You are governing um, behavior. You are determining the texture of, of, of conduct, of behavior, of curriculums, of contents everywhere. So when, when, so that's what we are talking about today when we talk about the transition of power. You need to know how that works and how that what that means for you. Then we want to talk about the um, architecture of that, you know, and how all of that works. Now, let me start by telling you that if you are listening to us today and you are one of those people praying for lockdown to be over, you can't wait for lockdown to be over. Trust me, that's a dangerous desire. That is a dangerous place to be. Um, we all want the lockdown to be over. Don't get me wrong. We all, all we all want it to be over. But if your own cry is that you don't know what is going on, you are just tired of the way things are, we are just at home, let this thing get out, I'm very sure you are one of the ready casualties or the ready victims or slaves post-lockdown. So if you are at home now and all of this is a disturbance to you, you are frustrated, indolent, there's a sense of apathy governing and being clouding your thinking, you are just, you can't, just can't wait, you are irritated by all of this and wondering what is going on, that is the fastest indicator that you are jogging full speed into irrelevance. You are jogging full speed into irrelevance. I mean, you have the best trainers on jogging you have the best track track running suit on jogging fast into irrelevance this you know, have you heard about confident ignorance before you know there's something called confident ignorance the idea that you don't know anything but you are not aware <laughs> that is you are out of the loop but you are not aware so a part of you is still very confident in a fading energy you are still very bold in a in a very in a highly fading energy that's where the jews were when jesus was coming and they were still like in charge of the system the pharisees and the Sadducees and the Sadducees, very arrogant they felt in charge but they were a fading quality because there is a principle that says the arrival of the new automatically If you camp around a fading platform, if you camp around a fading concept, you camp around a fading movement, you will be sincere, you will be honest, but you are going to sincerely be punished. People are sincerely in prison. People are sincerely poor. People are sincerely frustrated. People are sincerely confused. People are sincerely fading. The fading of power is not tied to determination. Determination is not a strategy. Life Hope is not a strategy. We explained that the last time. You don't hope that you are in charge. You know that you are in charge. There must be some signs to your positioning that make you be no, you, you that gives you the awareness that you are blocking a map. So I call it the land grab, the mind land grab, because attention has become the most critical resource in the world today. So no matter what you are doing, no matter how you want to do it, what you are really trying to connect is attention. It's attention. The last time we were on board, we spoke about the reality of preferences and prejudices, about preferences and prejudices. 
And we said that every time you identify a preference, it is because that is the last step to announcing a prejudice. All preferences precede prejudices. I'm going to go over all of that again because it's a major foundation to this conversation. What is a preference? A preference are the installments that come into your mind and to your thinking through influence, through interaction on a daily basis. For example, your sister is tall, your brother is tall, your mom is tall, your sister's all dated tall guys. Somehow, you are going to prefer tall guys. You just like tall guys, right? That's just how it is. It's not that tall guys are a factor of production or the determinant of value, but that is how your own preferences have come up. Now, you just like tall guys, so it's okay. The moment you gain independence of choice, you see, when you were at the preference level, you are probably 17, you were still in, at home, authorities were over you, your dad and your mom, you didn't have independence of choice, then you gain admission to the university. You are going to be on campus away from authority, authority eyes that govern your behavior for three months in the university, away from everybody's eyes. The moment you gain independence of choice, all your preferences are converted to prejudices immediately. Now, what are prejudices? Prejudices are conclusion without justifiable reasoning or explanation. Conclusion without justifiable reasoning. I'm giving you the most lay definition of it so that all of us can get. Knowledge block that is untrue but it's working for your own thinking. That means you rule a small village, otherwise called your mind. So you are in that place, that's like saying, I'm a black man, I am better than all white people. That's not true, that's prejudice. Because there are so many white people that can pay your salary till tomorrow. So you can't say you are better than all white people because you are black, or because you are white, you say I'm better than all black people. There are black people that can pay your salary forever, even if you don't do anything for them. So you are not better than all black people. That's just prejudice. So in the same way, you are in your house as a young girl, you said, I like tall people. I like tall people. I like tall people. Prejudice. The moment you gain independence of choice, I mean preference, the moment you gain independence of choice, your preference becomes prejudice. You will move from I like tall people, preference, to I cannot date a short person, prejudice. Because if you say you can't date a short person, you have to tell us why. Why can't you date a short person? Is it that a short person cannot think or it's not enjoyable to have sex with them or their sperm is weaker? You have to tell us what is wrong or they don't know how to make money. You have to tell us what is wrong with short people. Once you cannot justify that conclusion, you are locked in a prejudice. Now, what am I saying? The implication of that is that once lockdown is lifted, you also gain independence of choice. All the preferences you are building at home now with your lockdown, because as you are at home, trust me, you are forming new habits without your permission. Because preferences form without your permission. Preferences can appear into your public life without your consent. So you are forming new habits. Don't think you are just at home, you are in a tabula rasa of some sort, nobody is disturbing you, just have your life. You are forming new ways of waking up. You are forming new ways of going to bed. You are forming new patterns of thinking. You are forming new patterns of eating, new patterns of body management, exercise, keep fit, keeping fit. You are even forming new patterns of consumption. You probably are preferring takeouts instead of eating in a restaurant. You are forming new ways of dressing. You are getting more and more casual. A laissez-faire type of thinking is coming into you. Your form of, of, of serious exchange is reducing. You are replacing it with an air of freedom. And you are trying to, your home used to be a zone of comfort. All, all of a sudden, it's becoming a zone of not just comfort, but serious exchange. You know, the business calls you take only in the office before, you are taking them at home now. Your perception about home, your definition of home is changing from family zone to war zone. You see, a lot of things are happening around you at the same time. The interaction you don't used to have. Some of you have had some level of um, synergy between husband and wife only because you had the privilege of spending 10 hours away from home every day or spending 15 hours away from home every day. So you can't, you have the energy to have a concentrated type of thinking. I'm just coming home and to come and spend eight hours. At the end of eight hours, I'm back outside. 
So that has been the peace of your home for the past 15 years without knowing. All of a sudden, you are now sentenced to 24 hours at home. 24 hours. So you, are, you now have to endure. <laughs> you have to endure, you know, the irritation of that sustained energy. So how does all of that come from? Some of you have beaten it already. You found another way of establishing peace. You now have another peace equation. You know, home plus control plus patience equals peace. So, or equals creativity or equals hard work. So, you've changed the equation of production. You've changed the equation of your thinking. So, what that means is you are new. You are already new. Um, coach has taught for years that you only need 30 days, 60 days to form a new habit. You have been home for over 60 days now. You have been home for 30 days, for over 27 days. If you, for one moment, think you are this, still the same guy pre-COVID, you are making a big mistake. You are a different person. With, you are a different guy. The moment they lift um, the, the COVID lockdown um, structures, you are now a new person with a fresh level of prejudices. Those who are going to get you to give them money must come because you two don't know who you have become. You don't know who you have become yet. You don't know what you are yet. So guys who are going to sell to you must come into your brain to come and predict your new prejudices so that they can design their products and services to meet that. And guess what? They can't wait for you to come out and buy before they know that. By the time you are buying, you are deciding against them. Your purchasing power is going to product B, which they don't control, so they are out of the loop. So they, when you are on lockdown now, entrepreneurs and innovators need to be renting a space in the heads of people and predicting and buying patterns and predicting consumption patterns you know and predicting new prejudices so that you can form yourself around it a friend of mine a friend of mine is planning a major conference post covid is planning a major conference offline conference post covid so two days ago, he invited me to his strategy session. When I came in there, I told him they've been working on that conference for about two weeks now, about two weeks. I told them that everything they have done from the very first day until now is called labor loss. They have just wasted their time planning this decisively and aggressively for nothing. You see, all they have done for two weeks is focused nonsense, as far as I'm concerned. So they are not going to achieve everything they have designed. First of all, who told, how did they know people want to come and gather? How did they know that? They must know that um, <laughs> people don't even want to gather. Let me tell you, the strength of conference, the strength of conference is that it works on delayed response. That means that people are willing to wait for 16, six months to, for you to plan, plan your conference for them to know what is next in your industry. So conference will happen every four months or every year. So you are telling people actually in a zone and a season of speed that they should wait for one year to come and learn from your conference. Nobody's going to do that anymore. Number two, you are also saying people should come and learn at your time, in your environment, in your space, and at your time. Why do you think Netflix is making more money? Why do you think Zoom is making so much money? Because prejudice of consumption has changed. People now want to learn at their time, in their own space, on their terms. They want to be entertained on their terms, in their space, and in their time. That is why Amazon is selling. That is why Netflix is selling. Have you heard about Quibi? Have you heard about Quibi or something is coming out? You know, and everybody is investing in Quibi or something. Why are they investing there? Because every is clear. Why is Iroko TV jumping on one spot? Why are they jumping on one spot? Because they are not able to diversify and and texture their content to meet global idea. Meanwhile, uh, Netflix is supplying everything that Iroko TV used to supply. The strength of Iroko was the Iroko of African movies and the Iroko of African consumption. But from nowhere, Netflix is now providing Iroko with uh, the content of Iroko. All the movies of Iroko are available on Netflix. Then Netflix has more than Iroko can offer, which is Oyebo TV and all of that, and Western content and European content and North American content. It's all available there. 
is simply a matter of connection. What is that telling you? Your competition is no longer in Lagos. Your competition is not in the, the guy in your market in Gambia. There is a company in Silicon Valley that will be competing. Your own business is in Ido or in Mobasa or Dakar. But your competition now is free because online creates a level playing field, both to rise and to die. Because the truth is, the guys who are going to compete with you before COVID can be the guys in your space, in your locale, in your geography. Competition can exist within the limits of your geography before. If you are a church, for example, and I love a church in America, but I am locked in Accra, and I want to be part of a church in Houston, how do I abandon this church and go to a church in Houston? It was tough for me to do before. So I will have to surrender and endure the frustration of consuming what I don't really like, but I have to take. Sunday in, Sunday out. Today, the church I want in Houston is a button away from me, just a button. I don't need traffic to go there. I don't need a plane to go there. And I can give all my tithe and all my offering and buy all my, spend all my money there. And it's okay. And it's a button away from me in the comfort of my sitting room. And that is amazing. All the things we used to say that uh, as square two or three are gathered, where two or three are gathered is now disrupted because it's another level of gathering now. Where two or three are gathered can now happen offline. I mean, online. We don't need to come to a place. All the things we used to say like um, um, corporate anointing. Corporate anointing is now relative. It's now <laughs> obvious that corporate anointing is not, it's not geography sensitive. It wasn't location sensitive. But all this while our ignorance permitted it, because of the face and the character of knowledge in itself, because the strength of wisdom is shared in faces. That is why we have the irrelevance of a generation is the proof of engagement of the next generation. The, the imperfection of a prevailing generation is the relevance of the next generation, right? So that's, all of that is what is happening. So how do you ensure that the new world have a space and a stake for you. So that is what we mean by this transition. And you want to spend this time in research and fact-finding. Let me announce to everybody, your strategy room must be kept. Your library should be kept. Stay in your library, read books, listen to CDs, strategize, call people, get consultants in, do all of that. They are very important. But let me tell you what is more important now is the leap of your maker. Your strategy room now is God's presence. Your biggest war room is the presence of God. You now need to come into that space, put your ears on the right leap, and begin to assess knowledge at the highest level. The world and the civilization we have known until now, kingdoms and nations, have been built on the force of education, never on academics. Now, today, I want to announce to everyone listening the limits of academics as we move into the future. You have to be careful about the premium you place on academics. The highest advantage of academics is regulation. Never forget that. The goal of academics is regulation. What does that mean? Two people can cut your tummy. One will wake you up two hours, of, two hours after. The other one, you are dead if it there opens your tummy. He doesn't know what to do to wake you up. That is the difference between a killer and a surgeon. Both of them are going to dip a knife into your tummy. But one will dip it with anger, the other one with skill. So the difference in that skill and anger creates their ability to either wake you up or take you into a coffin. You see? Now, how do you know you want to go and meet when you need surgery? Academics. It's academics that allows you to know, go to a surgeon, not a killer. Don't go to anybody that can just use a knife. Go to a one that is trained to use a knife. So it's academics that lets you know the one you should go and see when somebody, two people are carrying a gun. When you are under siege, two people are carrying a gun. One is an arm robber, the other one is a police officer. How do you know the ones you go and meet? Academics. So the goal of academics is regulation. Somebody can debate a lot. He can argue from night from now till tomorrow. But another one is a lawyer. Both of them can argue, but one can argue to save you from a jail sentence 
The other one will depress you with his arguments and keep you contained within his energy. That is a debater. So how do you know the difference between the two? You know the difference between the two because of the force of academics. If you for one day think academic is an advantage beyond what I just said, you are already locked in the past. So you need to get out of that and understand that the objective of academics is to do two things. Create regulation. Then set the limits for the masses and the generic thinkers to define their own interaction and the length of their meaning. So what that means is that it's academics that will tell you to become a lawyer, become a doctor, become an engineer. And all those who are not as blessed, sorry, when I say blessed, I mean by providence. People who are not as gifted and who have not placed enough demand on themselves or society has not allowed them to exercise their God-given thinking at a level. And so they fell into the wrong society or they found themselves in the, under the wrong teacher or the wrong influence or the wrong parents that did not allow their individuality to thrive. Those people must find comfort in the avenues and the uh, platforms academics provide. Then you have education. Education is superior to academics. And you can have a PhD and not be educated because education is not the acquisition of academics. The, the goal of academics is recall at best. Academics is the test of recall at best. Education is the test of imagination and use. Is the test of imagination and use. Imagination and use is seated on the force of observation observation. So what is education? Education is the power of the human spirit to experience its environment, to experience its environment, then to question it deep enough to find the options that exist in it, and then to know the options to embrace as a matter of supreme importance and urgency. I'll take it again. Education is the ability of the human spirit to question its environment, to observe its environment first, then to question it deep enough to find the options that exist in that environment and to know the ones to embrace as a matter of supreme importance and urgency, right? That is the thing that builds merchant banking. That is the one that built Microsoft because they didn't finish school. That is the one that built Facebook because it, it wasn't a graduate from Harvard. That is the one that finished most of the institutions you know in the world. That is the one that went to the moon. That is the one that built merchant banking. That is the one that went to Mars. That is the one that gave you Bluetooth technology and GSM technology and all of that, gave you the internet as we know it today. So the idea is education has helped the world more than academics has helped the, has helped the world. And education brings more strength and capacity and, and, and control and monopolistic power more than academics has ever brought. The, the strength of intellectual property, all of what we call patents, are built on the force of education, the power of the human spirit to break into options. By that standard, by that meaning of education, by that definition, so many people are not educated. They are not educated. So what that means is you need to break into education. But trust me, what I'm saying is this. Please permit my sweating. I don't have anything here to claim. And I just finished two webinars before now. So I just finished two webinars. So that's why I'm sweating. So please permit me. So the idea is this decade is going to be governed by revelation, not education. So we have seen the height of education. It produced Amazon. It produced Microsoft. It produced Facebook. But revelation is the new level of access. Now, revelation is superior to education is superior to academics. Fortunately, revelation, you see, academics is what you are taught. Education is what you teach yourself. Revelation is what you are given. So there are three different things. You can work hard and educate yourself. You can work hard and give yourself academics. But revelation comes from a working, talking relationship, not based on your own plan, but based on the agenda of the revealer. So there is a revealer who is the custodian of revelation. Education is wisdom, access to what is available. 
what is bestowed to the world. Academics is access to what is bestowed to man, controlled within a world. But revelation is access to what is in his heart and his mind. So you can't come there except access is given to you. So a working, talking relationship is yep. the channel your, for assessing that place. Your audio is low. Yes, sir. Audio is low. Yes, sir. Your audio is low. My audio is off? Is is low. Something went wrong with your audio. My audio is what, sir? No, it's good now. It's better now. Your audio Am I good now? Yes, yes. Your audio is better now. Great. Great. So, um... Revelation, 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 revelation. Revelation. So, revelation. Right? So, revelation is the new light. For those of you who are conversant with scripture, Bible says stuff like, no longer, Isaiah 60, shall the sun give you light, nor shall your moon win. He said, the Lord shall be your everlasting light, so that your gates can be opened continually, and the Gentiles can bring their wealth to you. Now, that light, that everlasting light, what is it in the world today that can keep your gates open 24 hours? That can keep your gates open in an everlasting format. What is it? The gates of your business, the gates of your church, the gates of your mosque, the gates of your temple, the gates of your non-profit, the gates of whatever you do. To keep it open two, four hours, only technology can deliver that. And it is online. So God is releasing a fresh agenda of insight based on revelation. And that revelation is not offline, it is online. Now, let me break it down more. The way that is going to work is online is the front door to all activities, and offline is now the back door. The last time I spoke, I, don't re I can't remember if I gave Amazon the example of Amazon, how Amazon actually has stores offline, a lot of stores offline. But they don't limit their activity to their offline store. The stores of Amazon is to support their online interaction. Online is the front door. Offline is the support for the front door, which is online. So the question to you, first of all, is whatever you are doing now, to be a stakeholder in post-COVID, how do you create, upgrade your offline work to become your front door? To, sorry, your online work to become your front door and switch your offline work to become backdoor. How do you do that? That is one. Secondly, I'm going to give you a very key insight into how to build, to build your next level of, um, of relevance. Now, don't forget. Don't forget this. I'm talking about architecture now. I've moved away from transition to architecture. Don't forget this. This is the first level of your architecture. Next level of power is always hidden in your prevailing level of power. Your next level of power is always hidden in your prevailing level of power. I will explain that. It's not just hidden there. It is hidden there as a loophole. It is hidden there as an imperfection. It is hidden there as um, maybe even an error. Bottom line is that if you look at my glasses right now or my watch, both of them look like they are perfect. Look at the glasses of coach. It looks like it is perfect. I mean, spotless, amazing design, incredible symmetry, right? But you see, as beautiful as that glasses is, the next level of these glasses in five years' time, if you are buying the same glasses, the next level of it is already inside these perfect glasses as an incompletion, as an imperfection. So tomorrow's people are going to find the error. They are going to buy the error inside this glass. They are going to buy the imperfection inside this glass to be able to get the next level. Now, the makers of this glass don't care about what the market is buying right now. What they care about to, be, to remain relevant is the incompletion inside this glass. So what does that mean? In the excellence, in the prevailing excellence that you see, in the prevailing excellence that you see 
there is a loophole, there is an imperfection, not in mediocrity, not in mediocrity, in the prevailing excellence of what we see. There is a loophole inside this. That loophole is what we must find and build solution blueprints around to form the next level of this thing. So tomorrow's people will be unnecessary except for the imperfection in today. It is the loophole in a prevailing power that determines the strength of the next generation. So tomorrow's people, we have nothing except for the errors of today. So I tell critics, particularly young people who criticize, the, criti the, the, the things you criticize as the error of the fathers, of those who are in charge of the system today, they are not supposed to be your platform of criticism. They are your platform of engagement. God is showing you your own responsibility tomorrow. Instead of focusing on solution blueprints to convert those loopholes into a solution, we are busy criticizing those things. And that is why we lose our power and we become the casualties of the very insight that we have been given. So the next level of your watch is in your watch. The next level of, I, of Samsung 9, Note 9, was already in Note 9. By the time they created Note 10, they just found the incompletion in Note 9, built solution blueprints around it, and created Note 10. The next level of Note 10 is already inside Note, Note 10 as an incompletion. They will find solution blueprints around it and build the next level of, of, of Note 10. What does that tell you? If you are ready, you are late. If you are ready, you are damn late, right? So readiness is a journey and an oppressor. Because you can count all of your destiny on readiness before you put your products out. When you camp around readiness, you are waiting for your own conviction before you can share your ideas with the world. That's the wrong thing to do. The strength of your idea is in, going to be determined by the pockets of the world. What they buy is what you should make. So, and how do you know what they want to buy? Throw what you have out there and it will tell you whether you are right or wrong. You don't need your conviction to release your ideas. You need the conviction of the market to release your ideas. So as we are in a period of interregnum, this is a period of interregnum. In this interregnum, you need to come home. Part of coming home is not to be distracted by the um, errors of the, of the now. We are not making money. There's lockdown. We cannot move. I cannot go and see my boyfriend. I can't see a soccer game. The football game at the, at the stadium is out. We cannot do the NFL draft this year the way we used to do it. The fun, you know, and all of the things we used to do. Ah, what, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? You see, if you remain in that mode, you will pass the test of correctness, but you are going to fail the test of progress. That means you are going to be correct. This lockdown is not good for our economy. Correct. It's not good for our economy. But how does that help you progress? So you are trying to solve a fact. Now get this, it's a very key part of power dynamics. You don't solve facts, you solve problems. You don't solve facts, you walk around facts, you solve problems. Every time you see a lunatic, go, go close to him, you will see that he's a determined man trying to solve a fact. <laughs> when you are trying to solve a fact, that's like, like when you see girls bleaching and changing their color, they are trying to solve a fact. That is why somewhere in their future, they pay dearly for it. Because you don't solve facts. You walk around facts. You accept facts. Then you walk around that fact. If you are disabled and you have only one leg, I don't know what you will do in this world, but I can tell you what you will not do. You are not going to win the gold medal in 100 meters at the Olympics. You are not going to do that. No matter the prayer points supporting you, you are not going to use one leg to run nine seconds, 100 meters. You are not going to do it. But let me tell you what you can do. You can run the biggest company in the world, even if you have one leg. Even if you have no eyes, you can be the chief executive of a company bigger than Google. But it will be a big tragedy for you to now be determined that what you will do in this life by any form of motivation is to win the 100 meter dash in the Olympics. That would be a very terrible articulation of your body. So what is happening now is you need to come into a reality, define the limits that are before you. The limits before you now is that you don't have a choice. The only platform of expression you have 
is now online. Now, I was telling you about the loophole strategy. So what should you be doing now? You should be answering two questions critically. To find that loophole, look for two questions. I think I mentioned it the last time, I'm not sure, but look for two questions. Number one, what is too much right now? What is too much? What is too much? Who is too much? What environments are too much in my life that I need to go less? What do I invest in that is too much? I need to invest less. Am I overstaffed? Right? What is too much? Do I have too much friends? Do I go to what is it? What is too much? You know, you need to answer that question. Now, when you are asking what is too much, okay, I'm, I'm going to come there. The second question is what is too little? What is too little? Are your, do you need more skills? Do you need to get more skills, acquire more skills? Do you need to bring more people into your life? Do you need to network more? Do you need to get into people? Do you need to change your online structure? Do you need to get a podcast out every day? Do you need a blog now, finally? Do you need a, a, a digital marketer in your team now? Do you need to fire your current business development officer or upgrade him to a level of observation and get some legs in and some new hands in in digital marketing who can control your business? Like, for example, myself, I have a, an entire set of people that control my entire operation. You know the only thing I do in this world? All I do is think and create. I don't work. I don't plan. Sorry, when I say I don't work, I mean I don't do the regular things. I don't plan. I don't, I don't, send, I don't go check my social media and say, what do I do? What do we need to do? I, those are, those are, they have become a major skill. Digital marketing is a major skill. In the same way, I will never treat myself. I don't self-medicate. I'm not a doctor. No matter what I feel, how correct I am, I will speak to my doctor. In the same way, don't self-medicate. Don't tell yourself what you, how you need to behave on social media. They are, those are areas of experts. Don't tell yourself how much you invest in promoting your content. Don't tell yourself how you should talk on social media. It's like medicine. You don't have, it is a big skill now. Get Talk to professionals in digital marketing. Let them guide you. I've just signed a deal with a new CEO of my company who is a complete landlord online. So I've given him that space. What is he going to do? We are in the content generation. He's going to use my content to create all manner of things. It's okay. All I really enjoy doing is thinking, creating, and talking, like I'm doing now. <laughs> so, 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 so I really don't have to do any other thing. There are now systems online. So this is not a time of determination. Determination is not a factor of production. Go and check it. Land, labor, capital, entrepreneur. You can't find determination there. So it's not by, this is not a time to be sincere. I'll be saying stuff like, God sees my heart. God sees my heart. You are correct. God sees your heart, but we don't. The market don't. So leave God. God has given you an instrument to culture. This is how you have to go. Now, I don't know if we still have more time or, or coach wants to throw in the question before on, I move on. Let's go on. Let's should, go I, on. should I continue, coach? Yes, but please go ahead. Great, great. So, so now, having understood all of these blocks, having understood all of these blocks, last week, the last time we were here, I spoke about five other questions in translating to a new market. Every time you answer those first questions, you give birth to a new market. And I will go over them real quick. If you want to listen to it, talk to um, DM Coach and his team. Go to Orca um, platforms and ask for the replay. They will give it to you. But last week, we spent time answering five questions. Where is the money? Where is the money? Who is holding that money? When I say who, I don't mean one individual. What community of people? Are they young people? Are they old? Do they work on? Is it online? That is it in the night they are online? Is it in the morning? Is it in the evening? You know, where are these people? Who is holding this money? I'm sorry, where is the money? Who is holding it? How do I reach those people? How do I reach them? How do I reach them? If I reach them, what do I say? If I reach them, what do I say? Now, let me pause around what do I say. This is not a time when I say what do I say, I mean your pitch, your narrative, your copy, your go-to-market message. What is that thing? Now let me pause there. 
In the past, pre-COVID, we are taught by brand gurus and by advertisement executives. We are taught to rally our messaging around emotions or philosophy. So a lot of the messaging out there is between emotions and philosophy. And it's correct. It's true. There's a place for that. But there's a new addition that has always been there, but mainstream society has not asked for it. Now, because the future is strictly for culture shapers, it's strictly for culture shapers, that third ingredient is now on the front burner. It's the real King Kong of messaging. You know what it is called? Ideology. Ideology. Now, if I spend the remaining time I have on this, it will have been enough. Now, listen to this concept. Ideology is the new strength of narratives, not philosophy. Do you know that philosophy has never changed the world, but it has moved the world? So a lot of what we call advertisement, a lot of what we call copies in the past, about brand management, has always been based on philosophical constructs, right? The whole idea of emotions um, in, in, at this level of, of, of communication and sales. Please, I'm not talking about emotional intelligence. It's a perpetual skill. You can't have to grow emotional intelligence. That's not what I'm talking about. So don't say, ah, emotional intelligence is not important part of the game. What we don't mean is, no, that's not what I'm talking about. Emotional intelligence is a perpetual skill. I'm talking about emotions in building narratives to rent a space in the head of the market, okay? To do that, you have to shift. Part of that shifting is to understand that emotion is a, is, 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 cannot lead you to that conversation. Philosophy cannot lead you there. Do you know that one of the greatest philosophers that ever lived was Socrates? Socrates. Do you also know that that Socrates lived before Christ? Because a lot of people don't know that he lived before Christ. All those things he said that we are still studying in the universities today, he said them without the blessing of religion. He said them without the blessing of faith. There was no Jesus in the world. Jesus had never come when Socrates lived. So all those big, gigantic quotes of Socrates, Plato, and all those guys, they were said without the benefit of religion, without the construct of faith. It came from the clarity of the human mind. That's where it came from. Now, if you take it further, one of his biggest statements was, know thyself. Know thyself. And that's a powerful statement by any standard. And it is still relevant to today. Every form of human development will start with identity. Know thyself. So it's correct. The only snag was, knowledge determinators can speak ahead of their time, they can speak beyond their practice, and they can speak ahead of themselves. That is the only reason why Socrates committed suicide. You see? <laughs> Which shows you the limits of philosophy. Because obviously, there's a dimension to himself he doesn't know that made him to terminate his existence as the response to the conflict of his time. Now, going somewhere, Socrates committed suicide. What does that tell you? Philosophy, go and check. This is not my view. This is available. Philosophy is not the strength of dominance. Ideology has always been the tool of dominance. There's nothing you can point to in the world that philosophy has transformed. But ideology has transformed everything. Communism, ideology. Socialism, ideology. Democracy, ideology. Capitalism, ideology. Nazism, ideology. Terrorism, ideology. Islam, ideology, Buddhism, ideology, Christianity, ideology. There is nothing that has changed the world onto good or onto evil that is not founded on ideology. ISIS, ideology. Um, uh, Al-Qaeda, ideology. Everything evil, the best of human movement, the worst of human movement has been founded on ideology. Now, I'm going to use ISIS as the case study of post-COVID. Right. We are not proud of ISIS. ISIS should be jailed. P yes, sir. Okay, PK, we have two minutes. I'm going to end this so that we can start all over again. I want to give them... Bonus. Great. I'm going to give them Great. bonus. 
So we're going to end this, um, and then we will start all over again so that we can have it in two parts. Um, so for everyone that is watching, we have uh, uh, thousands of people that are watching. Uh, we're going to end this. We want you to come back. And when we come back, PK will be back, and then we will take it off from ideology and using ISIS as the case study. So I'm going to end this now, and then we'll come back. PK, see you in a minute.